Stanford University. And we're now going to have an expert panel talking about the Farm Bill. I'm only going to introduce the moderator, and he will introduce the others. It's only going to be a brief introduction. Some of you have got these postcards. Anybody got a postcard in their hand? Hold it up. It actually has the bios of all the speakers on it. So we'll even walk down the aisle if you didn't get the bios and you want to see who all these fabulous people are. All right, so I would uh, first like to introduce our very own co-director of the Woods Institute for the Environment, Barton Buzz Thompson, who was one of our lead speakers at Food Summit 1. He participated in some of the um, political conversation about the Farm Bill the last time it was renewed, and he and his expert panel will be talking about how important this issue is and addressing some of the controversies surrounding it. Buzz and panel, thank you. Okay, well thank you very much, Christopher. So it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, good evening. Come on, you guys can speak up more than that. Good evening. Okay, excellent. So uh, this evening we have, I think, a tremendous panel discussion of farm bill or food bill. And in this panel discussion, we're gonna be talking about what I think is probably one of the most important but least understood pieces of federal legislation that exists, which is the federal farm bill. The farm bill began back in 1933 in the midst of the Great Depression when President Franklin Roosevelt, thinking that one of the solutions to the Depression was actually to raise prices, decided to pass legislation that paid subsidies to farmers to restrict their production of seven main commodities so that commodity prices would rise. The United States Supreme Court actually held that piece of legislation to be unconstitutional. But despite that inauspicious beginning, Today, the Farm Bill is indeed one of the most important pieces of federal legislation there is. Under the Farm Bill, we have, over the past decade or two, been spending about $100 billion a year on a variety of programs. The 2008 Federal Farm Bill had a total of 15 different titles. Four of those titles are of particular importance to the panel this evening. The very first title, the Commodity Title, includes continued subsidies to farmers growing specific crops, including corn, cotton, wheat, rice, and soybeans. A separate section of the Farm Bill deals with crop insurance. You have another portion of the Farm Bill which includes the federal food stamp program, what's frequently known as Supplemental Nutrition Assistance, or SNAP. And that is actually the largest of all the programs under the Farm Bill. Uh, when the Farm Bill was reauthorized in 2008, the funding for that was about two-thirds of all of the funding under the Farm Bill, and the most recent statistics I've seen is that in the face of the Depression, it's closer to 80% today of all of the funds that are spent under the Farm Bill. And then there is a fourth important provision of the Farm Bill that we'll be talking in part about tonight, which is a conservation provision which pays farmers to engage in good environmental practices. It's actually the smallest of all the provisions that we'll be talking about, but it's actually the largest conservation program in any federal legislation in the United States. And those are just four of the provisions of the Farm Bill. Other provisions deal with everything from energy on agricultural land to horticultural and organic agriculture. Now, in recent decades, Congress has revisited and reauthorized the Farm Bill about once every five to seven years. This year was supposed to be the year that Congress would reauthorize the Farm Bill again, but this time around, the Farm Bill was stopped dead by political gridlock. The United States Senate passed a version of the Farm Bill the relevant House committee passed a version, but that version failed to pass the House as a whole because of relatively broad opposition to one or another provision of the Farm Bill. As a result, at the moment, we don't have a Farm Bill, and in fact, the Farm Bill expired uh, as of September 30th of this year. So technically, we do not have a Farm Bill at the moment, but do not fear those of you who worry about the nutrition program, at least for the moment, that's covered through a continuing resolution of Congress, and in fact, the actual expiration of the Farm Bill won't have any significant impact 
uh, until next year, and we'll find out from the panelists in a few minutes whether or not they're confident that the Farm Bill will be reauthorized at that point in time. So with that as background, I'm going to turn things over to our panelists, and I've asked each of the panelists if they could spend like five minutes just providing a brief introduction. Then we'll go into a discussion among the panelists, and then I will start asking them the questions that I encourage you to fill in on the various cards that Christopher and the rest of the crew are passing around right now. So we're going to start with Kari Hammerschlag. Uh, and I should point out that on the back of the program, you have bios on each of the various speakers. But just very briefly, Kari is an organizer, researcher, and advocate on food and agriculture policy at the Oakland office of the Environmental Working Group. And any of you who know anything about the Environmental Working Group know that it's played a major role in trying to promote conservation and reform in the Farm Bill and is responsible for putting together a database of all of the subsidies that the Farm Bill has paid uh, to various agricultural uh, uh, producers. Showing that Kari is a glutton for punishment, this is the second Farm Bill that she's worked on and actually the sixth that the Environmental Working Group uh, has uh, been engaged in. Kari herself worked for 15 years on international policy including trying to promote fair trade and improve livelihoods for poor farmers. But then she realized that one of the most important things if you want to help poor farmers outside of the United States is to change U.S. farm policy, and that's when she got involved in the Farm Bill. So, Kari. Great. Well, thanks so much, uh, Buzz, and thanks to all of you for being here to, to spend the evening with us talking about the Farm Bill. As, as Buzz mentioned, this is a $100 billion a year bill, and it's really the single most important piece of legislation affecting the food that you eat, affecting the crops that we grow in this country, affecting our environment, and affecting food security in America. And um, as, as, as you mentioned, Congress has written a new farm bill, but so far the Republicans have not brought the bill to the floor. And there are many in Washington, and I think our friend here um, from the American Farmland Trust, um, who would like to see this bill passed um, very quickly. Um, they're calling it, um, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, um, <laughs> there are many groups out there calling this a reform-minded farm bill that is good for America and good for farmers. Um, and we at the Environmental Working Group have a really different perspective. Um, unless this bill is significantly amended on the House floor, um, we can't support it. It's a bill that will continue to channel billions of dollars to the largest, most profitable, often environmentally damaging farms while slashing, uh, and crop insurance companies, while slashing nutrition programs, conservation, um, organic agriculture, uh, all kinds of programs that are really needed in this, in this country right now. Um, so, in many ways, this bill is really uh, one step forward and two step backwards. It's a reform-minded bill in that it does eliminate the direct payment program, which is something that the Environmental Working Group has been fighting against for the last 15 years. Um, the direct payment program is uh, essentially subsidies that go to farmers of major commodity crops, soy, cotton, rice, wheat, and uh, corn. Uh, for uh, crops that they once planted on their on their on their land, it's based on uh, it's based on the amount of, of crop that they once planted. Um, it's given to farmers every year whether crop prices are high or low, and or and whether they planted the crop or not. And it's um, a highly inequitable program. Seventy percent of the subsidies go to ten percent of the farmers. It's been driving small farms off their land. It's created, uh, driven land prices up. It's, it's, a, it's a bad program, and it's a, it's a great step forward that the, both the House and the Senate bill have proposed the elimination of these payments. So that's really good news. That's really good news. Um, so the bad news, however, <laughs> is that we're, si we're in a situation where it's really rearranging the deck, and rather than directing the savings of those subsidy payments, um, into programs uh, like local and healthy food programs, conservation, beginning and disadvantaged farmers, organic agriculture. They're going to plow nearly $5 billion um, of those uh, direct payment subsidies into a new 
uh, into crop insurance uh, programs and a new revenue guarantee scheme for farmers. Uh, at a time, actually, when uh, the you know, farm sector is doing very well, farm income is at an all-time high. And so, uh, so we're really concerned about that, and we're trying to, to stop that. Um, so what else will this, this, bill, this bad bill that we're dealing with um, in, in the House right now, what else, what else will it do? Well, it's going to cut $16 billion out of the nutrition program. That's the food stamp program, $16 billion. Many Republicans want that to be more. Um, it's going to cut conservation programs. It's going to cut organic agriculture programs. And it will significantly underfund programs in the health, for healthy food, fruits and vegetables, local and regional agriculture. Um, and these are um, programs that are where there's great demand and, and not enough um, money for these programs. There's also two really dangerous provisions in the House bill. One is a provision that um, prohibits the regulation of genetically modified crops and basically says that even if the courts halt the production of GM crops, that, um, that it won't matter because Congress will override that. Very dangerous provision. Another dangerous provision in the House bill is the fact that it uh, is a, a provision that will take the state's rights away for regulation of agriculture. So those are two bills. So it's a bill that we, won't, we can't support, and we continue to advocate for changes and hope that you all will, will join us in that. Um, I just want to say a few words about how the Farm Bill relates to some of the things that John Robbins was talking about, particularly around the health, nutritional needs of our country. And just to say that the Farm Bill, um, unfortunately, is totally out of step with the nutritional needs, the health needs, um, and the environmental needs, actually, of our country right now. Totally out of balance, as he said when he opened um, his talk. You know, on the one hand, we're told to fill half of our plates with fruits and vegetables. So imagine a plate, it should be half filled with fruits and vegetables. When you look at where farm bill spending goes, it's just a tiny fraction of the plate that gets um, spent on fruits and vegetables. Um, and that's, of course, much to California's detriment because we grow half of the fruits and vegetables in this country. Instead, as you've heard, most of the funding goes to support the production of commodity crops. And these are providing raw materials for, uh, for animal feed, for junk food, and for the fuel for your cars. And so at EWG, we, we follow the money. And I did a bunch of research to see you know, how much more money was going to commodity crops for research, marketing, everything, if you look at the Farm Bill. Turns out that we're spending eight times more on commodity crops than we are on fruits and vegetables. And that's just, um, that's just not acceptable. And it's a, it, it has serious health implications for our country. Only 4% of adults are getting what they need in terms of fruits and vegetables. And a recent study just came out that showed that if people just increase their fruit and vegetable intake by one serving per day, we can, save 20, we can uh, avoid 20,000 cancer cases in this country per year. Imagine that. And the Farm Bill, unfortunately, is not going to really help us get there. Um, so we have a lot of work to do to, uh, to get that uh, focus more on, on healthy fruits and vegetables. And then the final thing I would say is, not only is the Farm Bill subsidizing the wrong kind of crops, but it's, it's subsidizing the wrong kind of production systems, crop production systems. Um, the energy intensive, chemical, industrial, mostly GMO um, industrial farming systems in this country right now are wreaking havoc on the environment. They are uh, creating um, basically most many of the farming methods um, being used today are, are depleting soils at rapid rates. Um, very, um, you can look on our, our website. We've done many reports looking at the the, the really rapid soil erosion that's taking place. Um, it's also generating large amounts of greenhouse gas emissions, and and also promoting you know a lot of the the agriculture using vast amounts of fertilizer and pesticides that end up in our waterways. You may be surprised to learn that agriculture is the single most, uh, is the single largest contributor to water pollution in our country, more so than any of the other large industrial sectors, agriculture. And so unfortunately, you know, this farm bill is not going to really address that issue um, in the way that, that is needed. And hopefully we can talk more, go into some more detail and talk <coughs> about what can be done about this and how we can, how we can change it. Okay, thanks, Gary.
so particularly because we knew Kari was going to be on the panel, we knew we also needed a farmer. Uh, and uh, uh, we looked around. There were not very many farmers who actually wanted to be on the same stage uh, as, <laughs> as, as Kari. But we needed a, uh, uh, a farmer who actually understood the farming industry and somebody, though, who also uh, was progressive and actually understood where valuable reform could took place. Uh, and uh, so we immediately thought of John Scholl. Uh, John is the president of the American Farmland Trust. And if you don't know about the American Farmland Trust, it is an organization which sits between the environmental community and the agricultural community and tries to bridge the differences uh, between those two communities. AFT is a national conservation organization dedicated to protecting farmland, promoting sound farming practices, including environmental practices, and keeping farmers on the land itself. Uh, and I should tell you, I'm a board member of AFT, so I have a, <laughs> uh, a potential conflict here. John, however, is also a lifeline, uh, lifelong family farmer. His family farms 3,000 acres in partnership with another local family farm in central Illinois. Uh, he grows corn, soybeans, and sometimes wheat on that property. He also has put wind turbines on his property in order to try to generate uh, uh, alternative energy. Uh, and he's actually a member of the fourth generation of his family on that farm, and they already have a fifth generation uh, that have joined them. So, John. Well, thank you very much, Buzz. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to participate in this this evening. Uh, I'm also pleased to have people like Buzz Thompson on our board of directors, which helps uh, give a lot of great direction to what we do as an organization. What I want to focus my time on really are two things. One is, uh, what do we get and why should we care uh, about a farm bill? And the second question is really, what's in it for conservation and the environment? Buzz has told you a little bit about the organization I represent, the American Farmland Trust and I've been joking with my partners on stage here tonight, normally I find myself in between the Environmental Working Group and a Farm Bureau or some farm organization, and I asked which one wanted to volunteer to play the farm organization, and I did, didn't get any takers, which probably isn't a big surprise, but we do take very seriously the role of trying to be a progressive factor in challenging agriculture uh, to you know, certainly account for the good benefits that we get from American agriculture, but also really being uh, very serious and looking at some of the challenges we have and some of the problems we need to address and finding ways to address those in a, a reasonable way. Um, so first of all, addressing the idea of what do we get from a farm bill and why should we care? Uh, obviously you have an interest or you wouldn't be here tonight. Uh, I think there are a number of things that uh, make this certainly a farm bill and a food bill. Uh, in fact, I think it's probably very appropriate, and I don't know if any of you have made this connection that you actually are holding the summit at a week when George McGovern unfortunately passed away, because I think if you go back into the 1960s and 1970s, it was George McGovern as a United States Senator who formed a partnership with Robert Dole, somebody from the other side of the aisle, to really start to take a look at a comprehensive picture of our food system, and they had a very laudable goal of you know, ending <laughs> hunger. And it took a lot of different uh, policy issues, a lot of different approaches, a lot of different things to look at uh, to really try to move towards that goal. And so as a consequence, you see uh, an alliance, if you will, or a combination of food issues combined with issues that very much relate directly to what we do on the farm that has led to a combination of bills over the years. Uh, it does address a lot of different issues, and Buzz has mentioned a number of them, everything from the commodity title and subsidy programs to conservation to trade uh, to organic production and, of course, to nutrition and many other things as well. Some of the titles, if you look at the farm bills of the past, Food Security Act of 1985, uh, the Farm Security and Rural Investment Act of 2002. The last one was the Food Conservation and Energy Act of 2008, which I think really does speak to the idea that this is a comprehensive piece of legislation, deals with a lot of different aspects of our food system and our farming system, uh, all with the idea of trying to uh, do what we can to make sure we have an ample level of production uh, so that we do meet the food needs of a hungry nation and a hungry world. I have three specific examples that I would offer of things that I think we get from farm policy in the United States that we should care about and are the focus of a lot of debate in the current Farm Bill discussion. Number one, we do get greater economic security or economic stability in the agricultural and food production sector 
from the programs that we have in the Farm Bill. This is very important to folks in the farm side of the equation, certainly. Uh, I think it's a well-established fact that a lot of political instability very often is fueled by food insecurity. Now, this is something we take for granted in the United States. You know, we haven't had this problem, although I think if you do look at even recent history in the last few years, as food prices start to go up, as commodity prices have gone up, there has been a real level of interest generated and a real level of concern generated as to what that means to our ability uh, to make a very basic need of our society. Um, I think also what we've looked at this year in terms of the drought uh, has really driven home the importance of uh, this kind of uh, safety net, if you will, being provided uh, in the terms of you know, whether or not farmers are going to be able to survive from a very natural and recurring risk we have in agriculture. Uh, in 1988, we lived through a very serious drought, and we had an agricultural calamity and we had a financial calamity. Uh, in 2012, we have an agricultural calamity, and there certainly are going to be some who are going to feel a great amount of strain, economic strain from the drought, but I don't think you're going to see quite the level of uh, strain that we saw in 1988 because we've had some of these programs in place. A second thing that I think we get from farm policy in the United States is, as Buzz has very appropriately mentioned, this is the largest single conservation program in the federal government. Approximately $5 billion per year is put into programs to try to help farmers have the information, have the technical assistance, have some of the resources available to them to make sure they're applying the kind of stewardship practices that are needed to protect the environment. Uh, this, I think, is very important in terms of when you understand that over 50% of the land is in private ownership, uh, one of the significant public benefits I think we get from these conservation programs is an ability to help make sure that practices and conservation is being applied so that we get environmental benefits from that private land, which otherwise I think we would have a very challenging time to do. The third thing that I would point to as an example of the kinds of things that I think we get from the Farm Bill and why we ought to care is the fact that it does provide a lot of assistance to people who are in need, who need some food help or help in purchasing food. Um, I actually today just saw the updated figures for 2012 uh, for USDA expenditures and the numbers are pretty impressive and in some ways maybe shocking. Uh, in 2012, we spent $140 billion at USDA on various kinds of programs. Uh, $106 billion of that went to food assistance programs. Uh, so that's 75% of the expenditures in USDA in 2012 went to food assistance. Uh, $10 billion were spent on the safety net programs, the commodity programs that we've talked about, about 7%. Uh, 4.8 billion went to crop insurance, that's about 3%, and uh, 3.8 billion were spent on conservation programs, that's about 2.7%. Uh, I think this is an area where there is a lot of agreement of all the parties involved in the farm bill debate, certainly from the farm perspective. We understand very clearly this is a very important issue, it's a very important need, it's a very important part of the farm bill. I offer these three examples to really try to help point out the fact that this is a very complex bill. It's a very complex industry uh, with very diverse challenges that touch, touch on virtually everyone uh, that obviously eats, or everyone certainly in this audience here tonight, and I certainly suggest very strongly that it's something that you should care about and engage in very actively. The second thing and final thing I want to talk about is really what's in it for conservation and the environment. Uh, I've already said $5 billion roughly we're spending on uh, conservation programs over a period of years. It's been a very tough policy environment. Clearly, the focus has been with over trillion dollar deficits to cut. So it's not been a popular idea to come in and say we want more money for new programs, and that's something we've all struggled with. Uh, but I think there is some reason to believe that there is some reform that is a step forward not nearly as much as any of us probably want, but some things that I think can be positive and certainly we've been supportive of and trying to drive. One is the more strategic use of the dollars we've got in conservation. Uh, the chief of the NRCS said, we can have no longer any more random acts of conservation. Uh, typically the way a lot of these programs have worked is if you meet qualifications, if you go in the office, if you have the initiative to do something, 
there will be some support to be able to do uh, the programs or the uh, conservation practices you want to do. We have to be more strategic. We just don't have enough dollars to do everything. One example I can give here in the upper Mississippi River Basin, uh, data that the USDA has given us is that while we've seen nitrogen and phosphorus losses in that upper Mississippi River Basin reduced up to 50 percent uh, over the last five to ten years, uh, we still have 15 percent of the acreage in that river basin that is critically undertreated. Those are the acres we really have to make every effort to make sure we get assistance to because if we treat those acres, that's the area where we're going to get the greatest amount of environmental gain. A second part that I think is part of the bill that uh, is reasonably positive, which we certainly support, is to make programs more efficient and effective and accessible. There's over two dozen different programs that USDA has in the conservation area. There is overlap. Uh, there is confusion when a farmer goes into that office and wants to get involved in doing something in conservation. It does get to be a very bureaucratic process. It needs to be streamlined so that you can make them more accessible so we don't have overlap so that we aren't wasting money that could be going to solve an environmental problem. And there are steps. There's roughly going to be half the number of programs when this bill is passed, if it ultimately is passed, and I think it will be, uh, that will be a positive step forward. The third area in the conservation uh, focus that's been a major issue of debate, I kind of consider accountability. Uh, and one really focuses on this issue of the safety net, making sure we have a safety net that can provide some assistance to help farmers when there is a loss. And that's a key point, and that's one of the areas where Kari and I certainly agree. As some of the programs we've had, you haven't had to suffer a loss, and that's not right. And we need to change that, and I think you're going to see that take place. Um, but you know, I think it also makes sense that you know, there does need to be an assurance that if you are going to receive a safety net payment, and if you are farming land that is in USDA parlance, highly erodible, that you have to have a conservation plan in place. And this is one of the areas where, quite frankly, the farm bill that we have currently before us falls short. We're very concerned about making sure that we do maintain requirements in there that says if you're going to farm environmentally sensitive land, you are going to have a conservation plan. It's going to be something that's going to be a commitment to say we're going to farm responsibly and we're going to make sure that we aren't creating unnecessary environmental consequences if we participate in those programs. We have a lot of heavy lifting yet to do. Uh, I'm confident that we will see this farm bill pass, you know, hopefully sooner rather than later. Uh, again, I would encourage all of you, because we all do have a big stake in this. This touches everybody, uh, that you do make every effort to follow this closely, to engage in the process, because I think that is the way that we will get a bill that truly reflects the needs, the desires, the wants of the citizens. Okay. Thanks, John. So finally, this is a food summit. Uh, and so we realized that we needed the expert on nutrition and the federal farm bill this evening. And so we asked uh, Michelle Simon to uh, join us this evening. Michelle is a public health lawyer, also the president of Eat Drink Politics. She's the author of a fantastic book that I would recommend you buy if you have not read it before, Appetite for Profit, How the Food Industry Undermines Our Health and How to Fight Back. She's also the author of a recent report on food stamps follow the money, are corporations profiting from hungry Americans? I asked her the other day how she got involved in this particular area, and she told me that after making a personal dietary change, she discovered John Robbins' book on diet for a new America and was literally blown away. And she then discovered Marian Nessel's work, who inspired her to write about food politics herself. So, Michelle. Thanks, Buzz. Well, um, I think what I want to do for you is two things to help put this into some context. One is to talk about the enormous lobbying effort that goes into this bill, and the other is to talk about the food stamp program. So as you can tell from the first two speakers, this is an enormously complex piece of legislation, right? I mean, really one that only a lobbyist could love. And that explains <laughs> why more than a thousand groups spent over $173 million lobbying the 2008 bill. And these are some figures I'm giving you from a fantastic report put out by a group called Food and Water Watch called Cultivating Influence. So let me say that again. A thousand groups spent over $173 million lobbying. That's 50 million more than was spent on healthcare reform. 
a lot of money. Okay. This is my favorite stat, though, from this report. For every day that Congress was in session for the years 2007 and 2008, special interests, there's that word again, I don't know that they were special people, but special interests spent on average $539,000 lobbying on issues covered by the Farm Bill. Okay, every single day, over $500,000 was spent lobbying Congress over two years on issues related to the Farm Bill. That's how important this bill is to a lot of agriculture interests, food companies, etc. It's, of course, of interest to everyone here, but not everyone here has that kind of money to throw around. Now, about half of that total money was spent on some of the programs that were talked about, commodity programs, conservation, crop insurance, etc. So um, here's a quiz that is kind of um, not a trick quiz, because actually I already gave away the answer, but what do the American Sugar Alliance, the Meat Institute, the Dairy Farmers of America, the National Cotton Council, Outria Group, uh, formerly known as Philip Morris, Kraft Foods, Morris Candy, the Beer Institute, the National Restaurant Association, Walmart, Monsanto, and Bayer all have in common. Right, they all were part of that $500,000 of lobbying a day. So this is to show you the breadth of the types of organizations that are interested um, in lobbying on this massive piece of legislation. So obviously we have groups like EWG, a few others in there, not nearly enough, um, lobbying sort of on the good guy's side, and um, I put you in that category too. Oh, thank you. So I don't know how, how this report um, put your money, but I didn't look that closely. But I will say that they did lump together public health and anti-hunger group lobbying as being $9 million. So of that $173 million, $9 million of it were public health and anti-hunger groups. So, you know, I was thinking about this question, the way Christopher posed the panel, is this the farm bill or the food bill? I actually think of it as the public health bill, right? And public health is a very broad concept. I think it can actually encompass pretty much everything. Um, we've heard talked about tonight, but I come to this issue from this viewpoint. I'm a, I'm a public health lawyer, which means I don't sue anybody, although I do help others that might want to do that. But my um, sort of vantage point is how do we shape public policy in a way to help people make healthier food choices, right? It's a, it's a pretty simple concept and yet one that seems really hard um, to get forward in terms of public policy. So the Farm Bill is a massive opportunity to help shape our food environment, right? So Kari described um, some of how that works. And the way I think of all of these commodity crops, they are the engine behind our meat-centered and processed food diet, right? The, types of, uh, the type of diet that John Robbins talked about that um, has caused so much death and destruction in this country. It's not to say that the Farm Bill causes all of the problems related to our standard American meat-centered processed food diet, but it is a huge component of it. And yet, what happened this time around with the Farm Bill? I heard a lot of um, talk, frankly, may, way more talk than action in terms of public health groups acknowledging this massive disconnect between our farm policy and what we know as public health professionals, what the, the federal government is even telling us to eat with, you know, finally telling us to eat um, half of our plate full of fruits and vegetables. The point is, we did not see the kind of activity the lobbying from even, you know, this $9 million, I doubt that was even spent this time around on the 2012 Farm Bill. And that to me was just a huge disappointment. Um, a lot of people say they're working on the Farm Bill. All I saw was a lot of fact sheets coming out. To me, that is not, that's, you know, maybe a necessary but way insufficient way of working on the Farm Bill. EWG uh, is one of the few groups that's in there in Washington actually doing the lobbying, and that's what we need more of. Okay, so that's my um, lobbying piece. And I want to switch to a more specific component of the Farm Bill, which is an area that I really only um, started to dive into last year because um, of this debate that kind of grew up out of a proposal that New York City put forward, which, you know, seems to make a lot of sense, again, from a public health perspective, which was to say, gee, maybe it doesn't make so much sense to allow food stamp or SNAP um, dollars, SNAP program is Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, formerly known as food stamps, I kind of use both terms. Um, so New York City said maybe it's not such a great idea to have those federal tax dollars in this massive food assistance program go for soda purchases, right? I mean, we know from science that soda is one of the largest uh, contributors to the obesity epidemic, certainly a uh, component to a lot of chronic diseases. You know, do we really want our tax dollars to be used for that? and um, New York City just wanted to have a pilot program, asked US D 
FDA, the US Department of Ag Agriculture, which administers the food stamp program, could we just do a little test? You know, try out this idea of not allowing food stamp tax, tax dollars to be used for a disease-causing <laughs> product, right? Well, apparently that didn't make so much sense to a lot of people because all hell broke loose when that happened. And the most interesting thing to me was how this sort of rift then formed. And this is an issue that had been debated before, but it really came to a head with this New York City proposal back in 2010. So this rift was formed between um, public health groups and you know, the New York City Health Department and the state that put this forward and anti-hunger groups um, who did not want to see this proposal going forward. And we can talk more about um, why that was. But for me, the biggest question was, while this was all unfolding, well, wait a minute, we're missing this huge component here of this discussion, which is the food industry, right? I mean, the soda companies got to just kind of sit on the sidelines. I mean, they lobbied, of course, but they let the debate unfold between these two groups that really should be on the same side, right? Public health and anti hunger groups who really should want the same thing. So I decided I wanted to take a, a closer look at this whole program um, that we used to call food stamps, and it was pretty, uh, um, mind-blowing to me. I mean, my, mother, my other interest was looking at the politics of the Farm Bill. And, but then when I realized, well, two-thirds of the 2008 Farm Bill expenditures were going towards food stamps, I realized, okay, I need to look. This is really where the money is. And um, it has become a huge program. And because of uh, the downturn in the economy, and there's a lot of, I think, um, talk about it in the wrong way, that, oh my God, it's become this boondoggle of government program. Yeah, because we have an economy and a toilet and people are out of work and they need to rely on this vital program. Um, so 46 million uh, Americans are on food stamps, and an, an incredibly sad number, almost one in six. In California, it's about four million. Um, but SNAP is a critical program to help people um, get out of poverty. And I want to make sure before I go on, because people are um, afraid that I am criticizing this program in an era where Senate, the Senate has proposed $4 billion in cuts and the House is gunning for $16 billion and some are saying that's not enough. This is a critical program. However, um, it is under fire in part because of its, um, basically you can buy anything on food stamps, right? Unlike other food assistance programs like school meals, like the Women's Infants and Children Program, which has nutrition, guidelines around it, which makes sense, right? These are nutrition programs, not just nutrition like feed people so they're not hungry. That's sort of the old style, you know, thinking about nutrition. But nutrition as in like food that gives you nutritious, <laughs> like nutrients, right? I mean, that's the crazy thing. These are nutri- I always say, what happened to the N in SNAP, right? The word nutrition is in the program and yet we have pretty much a no holds barred approach to this program. You can buy almost anything except you know, alcohol and cigarettes and toiletries. I mean, but any kind of food is um, A-OK -okay on food stamps. It wasn't always that way. I just want to quickly give the, the history and then a little bit more on lobbying. But originally the program was um, meant to help farmers, on one hand, makes sense, um, and of, for when they had surplus product. So back um, in the pilot version of the program, the food that was available actually changed week to week based on what the farmers had in surplus, right? And then that food was made available to people who needed it. it made perfect sense. There was no Coca-Cola involved, no Cheetos, etc. cetera. Um, that all changed over time. There was a debate in 1964 um, about whether soda should be allowed in the food stamp program, and Senator Paul Douglas made a passionate plea on the Senate floor for not allowing um, Coca-Cola or PepsiCo. He said he didn't want to include any of these um, types of products. They can be a waste of money, especially for young people. I think it's a great mistake to include them. People, this is 1964, okay? And yet here we are having this debate again, all over again, and we could have fixed it decades ago, okay? So, um, you know, to me, this is a no-brainer, right? We have this incredible opportunity with this program. Now, over $70 billion a year in expenditures, a lot of it going for the wrong kinds of foods. I did this report to try and get underneath, well, where is this money going? Guess what? We don't know. The federal government does not collect data on how this money is spent. You'd think we'd want to know how much of our federal tax dollars, over $70 billion a year, is spent on Coke versus Cheetos versus carrots versus orange juice versus oatmeal, right? Wouldn't you think that would be something the federal government would be interested in knowing to what? Evaluate the effectiveness of the N in SNAP. Nope, not of interest, not collecting it, probably because 
folks like Coke and Pepsi would not be so eager to have that data made public. There is data available in theory for how much the retailers make, like Walmart. Some of that data I was able to uncover in my report, but the USDA is not um, sharing that data. If you ask them, they say, no, 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 we have it, yes, but we're not really uh, authorized to release it. There are lawsuits going on right now to try and get at that. Um, so the lobbyists are keeping the program from being improved. The New York City proposal was fought by the um, National Grocers Association, the Snack Food Association. It, again, this is just for soda. And yet the Snack Food Association, the Confectioners Association, my favorite one, they're the candy lobby. They didn't want to see this go forward and obviously all the soda groups. Um, I really think that we need to take a hard look at this program from the standpoint of nutrition. Also, who is it really benefiting? The banks, by the way, are another component um, that I uncovered that no one was looking at. So J.P. Morgan Chase has contracts in about half the states to um, administer the EBT, the electronic benefits portion of the program. How much money is going to J.P. Morgan Chase? We have to look state by state. There's no federal um, information on this as well. This, there are nine states that have tried to get bills passed to improve the SNAP program, but they've been um, stopped at every turn, and this is not going forward. It's not even, can I just say, this is not even part of the conversation with the Farm Bill right now. They are talking about cuts, and that's it. No one, except um, one senator, um, Mon, Mon Wyden from Oregon, and um, maybe a little bit of noise from a couple of uh, representatives, but this is like the political third rail in terms of anti-hunger programs. And it's really a shame because I think we are missing a huge opportunity. And um, I think I'll leave it there and move for discussion. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. So one of the things that I think I've heard from all three of you is that there's a lot to criticize in the federal farm bill. And if I've heard all three of you correctly, I mean, it basically sounds like a piece of legislation under which we spend $100 billion a year. And whenever you're spending that sort of money, there's a variety of interest groups or corporations that will come forward and try to get more of that money for themselves. And they're going to exert a lot of political pressure. So one of the questions I'd love all of you to just quickly address is, is there any chance of reforming uh, this piece of legislation? I know that at least two of you have been trying to reform it for a lengthy period of time. So is there any chance, and, and how do we go about trying to reform the farm bill? John? Um, it's very difficult. Um, I learned a long time ago, somebody told me the wheels of government move slowly, and I think this is a good example of how slowly it does move. Uh, obviously, there's been a lot of effort on the part of a lot of groups over time to try to make changes. Uh, those changes come by evolution, uh, it's not a revolutionary kind of process. And so, you know, we need to all continue to keep working to figure out how we can improve things and continue to move the ball in a, a positive direction. Uh, but I think we also need to understand and have a realistic expectation of what this process is going to yield. And to the extent that there are other ways that we can drive change or get things to, to happen, uh, we really need to uh, pursue those. You know, one of the examples I might give is uh, you know, we don't grow what we grow on our farm because we're in love with any particular crop. Uh, we grow it because, you know, the bottom line is we want to make a profit. We want to be able to sustain the farm. We want to have a standard of living, uh, hopefully somewhat like the rest of us that, you know, went to college with folks are getting when they went to town. And, um, you know, if we can see that we can pursue some other option and do so and sustain our farm, we'll do that. So those market signals, that's one example I might say what you're generating here in the interest of you know, fresh, healthy, local foods, uh, I think farmers will respond to that. And we need to look for those kinds of opportunities and pursue those kinds of options if you're going to drive real change. Okay. And, and Kari, so, so you advertise yourself partly as a community organizer. So how do we organize this community to change the farm bill? Uh, well, number one is um, I'd like to get you interested in crop insurance. <laughs> Um, because crop insurance is really where it's at right now in the Farm Bill, and that's the program that really needs serious reform. That's where the big money is after food stamps. Um, the crop insurance program is about $9 billion a year um, and counting. And just so you understand how it works, there, there are some major reforms that we're fighting for in the crop insurance program. Just, to under, just so you can understand briefly, um, the way it works right now, um, and this program has grown from $2 billion to $9 billion over the past 10 years, 
Um, we taxpayers cover farmers' premiums at about 60%. So just like your employer might pay 60% of your health insurance premium, we pay, we pay you know, 40%. We pay 60% of, of crop insurance. So corn is better insured than many of you and your friends and family in America. And so um, it's really important um, you know, that farmers have a safety net, really important. The drought that we just have experienced is, is good evidence of that. Um, but this crop insurance program is a total boondoggle because what's happening now with this drought is that farmers who had major losses are actually going to get more money from the government than they would have if they had just um, sold their crops under the price regime that they had, had gotten, had locked in back in, in March or April. And so that's completely, that's crazy. It just doesn't make sense. And so I actually think um, what the Environmental Working Group does and why I'm so proud of, of my organization is that we are, are science-based. We go out, we, we, we get the facts, we monitor uh, the environmental impacts on the ground. And we are, we are doing a lot of reporting right now and research on that crop insurance program. We've put out probably 10 reports. And so what we're trying to do, we think we can get reform. We think uh, it's going to take some time to kind of get permeate you know, the, the, the media, permeate the, the congressional offices, um, hopefully get more reform-minded um, representatives in there. But um, we need to get payment limits on crop insurance. Right now, if a, if a wealthy uh, private equity firm went in and bought 100,000 acres of land in Nebraska, guess what? We, taxpayers, are on the hook for 60% of their premiums. It doesn't matter how big a farm you are, you get 60% covered if you're a commodity crop. Fruits and vegetables, not so lucky. The farmers in California, some of them are covered, some are not. Um, but a lot of the diversified farms that, that provide our food, um, they don't, they're not covered. And they lost a lot in this drought. I mean, that was a real, real... So there's a lot of, there's a lot of room for reform. Um, and, you know, the conservation compliance issues that um, AFT has been working hard to get um, a requirement that crop insurance be, um, you know, where you have to do, do certain conservation practices if you get crop insurance. Um, I just think we all need to work a lot harder. We need all of you supporting it. We need you to pick up the phone and call your representative. I mean, reform will only happen if we have enough uh, eaters out there engaging in the conversation. Because right now, so much of the decisions are made in the House and the Senate Ag Committees. And those committees are stacked. We, in California right now, we only have two representatives on the Ag Committee and the House. And we have no representatives in the Senate. So we, we, have, we have our work cut out for us. Um, but I do think people are a lot more aware and you know, with, with support from, from the eaters of the world who I think are waking up to the need to get involved, I think we can, we can make some progress. Um, but we might need another year to actually get there on crop insurance. <laughs> Great. And, and so Michelle, I mean, on the nutrition side, I didn't even realize that there were some of the problems that you've just identified with respect to the SNAP program. So how do you get the public both engaged and then actually make a change in the farm yeah. bill? Well, I think there's um, a couple of challenges with that and getting people engaged in general. One is the complexity of it. Um, you know, this stuff is, is really heady. But I think, you know, it, it does behoove us as citizens to, to get educated. Um, there's also a lot of fear, and the fear comes out in, in different ways. First, there's... Uh, you know, over the years, the good news is we have b made some gains with these very small food security programs, organic programs, and so forth. Well, now that those programs are in place, of course, a lot of them are under threat, um, but the point is people just hang on for dear life. They settle for crumbs. And this point has been made over and over um, by, by others like Michael Pollan, and this is a huge problem. You know, it's like... Uh, there's been certain elements, certain parts of the Farm Bill carved out as crumbs, <laughs> and these groups, they don't want to take on these bigger issues because they just want to fight for their, um, for their few crumbs, and uh, that's got to change. And then there's the fear mongering, and I, I just can't think of any other way to say it, by the anti-hunger groups, and I alluded to it earlier, which is um, the for me, the main reason we don't see mobilization um, by enough groups to change, to fix, to improve the food stamp program is because they, um, <laughs> they are so influenced by the anti-hunger groups. And uh, 
you know, so when my report came out, for example, I mean, people were saying, oh, you know, I can't, you know, people actually ran away from me, you know, <laughs> who I thought would support it, because they were afraid of the fallout of their relationships with the anti-hunger groups. That's how powerful these groups are. It's not that, you know, they instill fear. I mean, I think, you know, there is a genuine concern about, oh my God, this is, you know, don't criticize the food stamp program because the Republicans are gunning for cuts. But you know what? We can't run away from the fact that this is a program that deserves criticism, you know? I mean, and, but we need, there needs to be um, more uh, bravery, frankly, um, among every group that is working on these issues to say, just to stand up to these anti-hunger groups. And I, I want to say also there's a problem in that these, um, many of the national, not the local ones necessarily, but the national anti-hunger groups that purport to represent um, hungry people are taking money from the same companies that benefit from the status quo. So they have formed coalitions to maintain the status quo. So, you know, these groups take money from Walmart. Obviously, Walmart wants to not change anything. So that's part of the problem, too. And it, it really means um, having enough strength of groups to come together to stand up, unfortunately, to people who should be our allies to say, enough is enough. We need to improve this program. Okay, thanks. So um, let's assume that you can actually get over the political hump and you can actually make a change in the, in the farm bill. I'm curious if you could make one change, if you'd really focus in, make one significant change to the farm bill, what each of you would say. So I'm going to start with you, Kari, because I'm going to guess that you've already talked about the fact that direct commodity payments are going to disappear. Right. It sounds like you would also eliminate crop insurance? No, absolutely no. not. Okay. Not eliminate crop insurance. Crop insurance is really important. Um, there's many ways that we can reform it. And in fact, um, you know, the Government Accountability Office, which does the independent analysis, they found that we could save many billions of dollars a year by putting payment limits, means testing, and um, limiting the, the premiums. So instead of paying 60% premiums, we pay 30% premiums. Or, or we, 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 and we did, and we did get some proposals on the Senate side on this. So that, those would be the reforms that I would make along with conservation compliance. And, and by doing that, we could generate um, several billion dollars, which we could then put into healthy food that would make people healthier and reduce our health costs and make in, in America. I mean, it would just make so much sense. We'd save billions of dollars by investing these dollars in healthy food, in supporting local and regional agriculture, supporting small and diversified organic farms, helping um, you know, livestock, um, helping you know, create, support grass-fed um, livestock operations, all kinds of things that consumers want. There's plenty of money in this farm bill to actually invest in really good programs. So that would be it, crop insurance reform, and we can do it. Um, we just need some more time and we need to build more alliances and we need to get more groups on our side to recognize that, you know, like, like Michelle was saying, there's a lot of fear out there and a lot of groups are not willing to take on the big agricultural interests because, frankly, it's really difficult. I mean, they're very well funded and it's, it's, it's and, and, you know, you're not, you're it's very difficult. But I think we're seeing some, some progress there and, um, there are more groups that have, are coming together right now to call for reforms, uh, for crop insurance reform and other things. So I think we're, we're making progress. Okay, great. So I Sorry. hear Rob, uh, then uh, Michelle saying that, uh, that her number one change that she thinks you would probably be able to make is to reform crop insurance and take some of the funds that you could make available by, for example, reducing the portion of the crop insurance that's paid for by the federal government and use that to support a variety of other public goods like healthy local foods. Right. So, John, would that be your change? I only get one. You only get one. <laughs> oh. But it could be, it, I'm sure Kari would be happy if you want to agree with her. And some money well, for conservation, too. I, I'll give I, you some money for conservation. Absolutely. Well, thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I, I want to say that, you know, reforming the safety net so that you're only paying for a loss is really high up on the list. but. You've kind of touched on that, and since I work for a conservation organization, you know, I have to say that I have this real strong belief, it's contrary to a lot of people here, is that agriculture can be a real positive benefit for the environment. You know, I think that's what farmers want to be. Um, you know, we don't always succeed and do everything we need to do, but I think if we can provide more incentives 
for farmers to provide environmental services and envir environmental benefits that you'll see the same kind of productivity brought to that objective as we've been quite frankly, I think, successful in producing you know, food at a fairly plentiful level. We can argue about what kind of food it is and all that, but we've certainly been very productive. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of room for innovation in this conservation area. Um, I'm a big believer in doing whatever we can to incentivize continuous improvement in farming operations. We should all have a goal of constantly assessing what we're doing, where are we vulnerable, what more can we do to make sure that we're not only protecting that farm so it's better when we pass it on to the next generation, but I can also look you straight in the eye and say we're farming responsibly, we're not having unnecessary environmental consequences off the site of the farm and having uh, problems we're having to deal with. I think one of the things that Buzz has worked on a lot, conservation markets. Uh, there's a lot of exciting work that, you know, you're taking a group of people in agriculture and farming that really understand markets. I mean, every day when we wake up, the first thing we're checking is, you know, what's the price of soybeans today? Uh, you know, there's lots of room, I think, to be innovative uh, to really figure out how can you incentivize through private market mechanisms the provision of environmental services through agriculture that, you know, really has gotten pushed to the wayside. There was some discussion of this in the last farm bill. There hasn't been any more in this farm bill. Uh, I think that really can hold the key to helping bring farmers to be a much more powerful force in bringing about some environmental benefits that we all would, all would like to see. Okay, thanks. And Michelle, your change. Um, so there are uh, two main uh, changes I would like to see with the food stamp program. Um, one is transparency. Like I said before, the federal government um, either doesn't make data available or just doesn't bother to collect it. We need to know exactly what's going on with this program to be able to even have an uh, intelligent com policy conversation about it. The other thing that, that could, um, well, you know, nothing's easy in Washington, but uh, is to allow states to experiment. So right now, USDA um, controls, you know, how the food stamp program works. And um, so New York City, like I said, applied for what they needed a waiver to be able to conduct this pilot program. Um, USDA turned them down. States have been trying to do the same thing. So what we need is the federal government, to, and Senator Wyden has, a, he tried to put this out there, by the way, um, while the farm bill was under debate in the Senate, and the anti hunger groups just slapped him right down. But the point is, <laughs> we need to allow states to experiment with these types of innovations, either not allowing soda, not allowing candy, you know, whatever they want to try. Because that way we can counter some of the talking points that we hear over and over again um, from the anti-hunger groups and, of course, in lockstep with the food industry, which is, oh, it would stigmatize people, oh, it's too complex. All of these excuses we've been hearing, we need to experiment, allow states to try to improve this program. Okay, thank you. So uh, I'd actually like to invite John Robbins to come back up here and join us again and participate in answering some of the questions that we've gotten from the audience. And so I'm actually going to uh, start out with, with one that's still about the, uh, the farm bill. Uh, but one of the questions is, is there anything in the farm bill uh, that encourages farmers to transition to smaller, organic, diverse, pollinator-friendly urban farms? In other words, is there anything that would encourage a restructuring uh, of the farm industry in the direction to which it sounds like most of you think we should head to at least some degree? You know, it, it's really very minimal. Uh, there are some programs that encourage or uh, give incentives to try organic production. Uh, there are programs, I think, in the nutrition side of the equation that, uh, uh, you know, tries to create more demand, create more markets, create more incentives to uh, get that kind of production uh, into the food system. Uh, there are programs that are fairly new. They aren't real well funded. Uh, and I think uh, certainly don't go to the extent that uh, an awful lot of folks in this room would want to see uh, take place. Uh, there are other programs that encourage beginning farmers, new farmers to enter the business. Um, while it's not directly related to you know, organic production necessarily, uh, I do think a lot of the opportunity that you see and a lot of the growth you see in the number of farms is at that smaller scale. Uh, where the organic production and the consumer demand that seems to be growing in that area uh, does present a much more viable opportunity for people to enter the, uh, the farming business and to have some support, some preferential uh, treatment in terms of some of the access to programs and the like. 
you know, I think is another, it's not directly related, but, you know, it's encouraging production at a level that I think does, you know, tend to uh, really gravitate more towards that kind of uh, agricultural production. Okay. Thanks. So another question that uh, came from the audience was actually one that we talked briefly about over dinner this evening. And the question is basically that in the Farm Bill, you have these 15 different titles, all of which deal with various subjects. And this is all in one piece of legislation that ultimately Congress has to vote up or down on. And so the question is, would it make more sense to separate the Farm Bill into 15 different bills that would each be voted on separately? Hmm. Well, again, I would say no, uh, because, you know, what you typically see Congress do is, you know, they don't pass a lot of bills. Uh, they may have different ideas to get some momentum here and there, and they'll get rolled into an omnibus package. You've all heard that topic. And so you end up with one big bill. And so I think, you know, even if you did that and there were needs that could get enough attention and enough uh, gravity in Congress to get movement, uh, you'd probably see a lot of those uh, start to tend to come back together because they're going to be tacked on where a bill's moving. They have a realistic chance of getting something past, but I think probably more importantly than that, I think one of the theories behind the food and the agri or food and farm uh, pieces of the farm policy being put together uh, is it does bring a more divergent set of political interests to the table with a stake, you know, with uh, a skin in the game, if you will, uh, that, you know, can then support each other. Uh, and I think that certainly has been the case. You know, I think if you were to separate those things out, uh, particularly as you see people get farther removed from the farm, uh, what you're going to see is really, particularly on the farm side of things, just not really being able to get enough understanding, not being able to get enough political momentum uh, behind the kinds of programs that I think are very helpful and very necessary for the farm community to be able to thrive and survive, uh, just really not getting you know, any attention. Any resources. Okay. Michelle. I, I just want to translate what you just said. Um, <laughs> <laughs> which is that, and then let's just look at history. So historically, the food stamp program was not in the farm bill. Um, and then something happened in politics called log rolling, which is when issues get combined so that um, basically one hand's back, you know, the back scratching, I don't know, whatever the metaphor is. Um, so what's going on, at least in terms of the, I can't speak to all 15 titles, but in terms of why um, food stamps is in the farm bill, which you might wonder how, why, um, the idea was actually so that the urban members of Congress that wanted to see the food stamp program continue um, would support the Midwest um, farmers, the, you know, the agriculture states, and vice versa. Okay, and so we have this sort of an unhappy marriage where basically the agriculture states support the, the urban, you know, and, you know, whether, I mean, Kari, you said you thought that that helps the, the agribusiness interests more than um, the people who need food stamps. And I'm not 100% sure food stamps is such a massive program and, you know, um, it is under threat right now. We do know that there are other food assistance programs that don't happen to live in the Farm Bill. The children's, I mean, a school meal program is in the Children's Nutrition Act. So, um, I don't know, I think it's an interesting question and um, I'm not sure what the answer is. So there's obviously a lot of people in the audience this evening as uh, on the panel who are interested in the issue of, uh, uh, of GMOs. And one of the questions uh, that the audience has asked is, we had a severe drought uh, over this last year, and to what degree were GMO uh, uh, corn, for example, important <coughs> to farmers in getting through the drought? Uh, and are there other steps that could be taken other than thinking about genetically modified uh, food products in order to actually deal with drought problems in the United States? There is one <coughs> GMO corn that is um, sold to farmers as a drought tolerant corn, uh, but it didn't do any better in this drought or minimally better um, than, than other corns. Mm -hmm. um, genetically engineered crops have been not successful so far in developing genuine drought resistance, or in enhancing nutrient profiles, uh, developing higher proteins or um, more effect efficient proteins, uh, or abilities to grow in marginal soils, to tolerate alkalinity or acidity in the soils. Um, these are the kinds of benefits that farmers would want 
and eaters would want. Mostly, though, the, the, what, what genetic, has been genetically engineered into our crops has been the ability to produce pesticides in every cell of the corn or the cotton plant, or to tolerate herbicides, uh, in particular Roundup. Um, the consequence has been a, um, a great deal more use of pesticides and herbicides um, than, than had been previously. And um, furthermore, there is a resistance developing in plants, to, uh, in, in the pests, uh, to, the, to this avalanche of, of um, biocides. None of this harbinges well. Um, and it's one of the reasons I think Prop 37 is so important to pass, so we can start to get some surveillance. Uh, people can know which crops, which foods are having these, uh, carrying these things. Um, I want to return to a question you asked the panel before I was up here, if I may, just for a moment, which was what change you would like to see, we would like to see, we would all like to see perhaps, in, in the Farm Bill. And it, it is such a complex, um, ginormous entity that, it, that it's so unwieldy. But if I step back for a moment, there are some changes that seem fairly simple to me. They're just in a different paradigm than the one that's typically involved in politics. I would like to see a tax shift where we tax more of the things that are causing damage and, and use the revenue to support some of the things that are healthy. For example, what if we were to put a tax on, just to be simple about it, white bread and use that income to lower the price to the consumer of whole wheat bread? It would make it more affordable to eat healthier bread for people in low-income communities. Um, what if we were to tax uh, soda pop and other junk food and, and use that income to lower the price to the consumer of fresh fruits and vegetables? What, we, what if we were to put a tax on pesticides and use that income to, to subsidize organic agriculture and organic food so that it wasn't more expensive to the consumer and would, the price would come down. I'm talking about not just leveling the playing field, but actually tilting it consciously in the favor of healthier food for people to eat. And then, then the, 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 the growers would, would get the market signals to produce food in, a, in an organic way. It would sell better. It would be easier to sell. And it wouldn't just be an elite thing at Whole Foods or at farmers markets or community supported agriculture. It would be genuinely available. And we're seeing the spread of organic foods today, but I would like to see that hastened and, and supported because I would like to, not just because it's, it's healthier, which I believe it is because it has less pesticides, but also because our farm workers need to be protected. Our water tables need to be protected. Um, the biotic community that lives in our soil needs to be protected. And um, I actually grew for 10 years 95% of the food that my family ate. So I know how hard it is to grow food. I know how hard it is in particular to grow organically because we did. And we ran into some problems that I didn't know how to solve from an organic uh, basis. And it was tempting to go to the chemical company or get, you know, and buy, buy agrochemicals. We didn't do it. We ended up not growing a few things a few years and learning to rotate crops and learning some things about organic methods. It's not easy. Uh, it needs the support of, 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 of a government and of a farm bill. I would love to see the farm bill actually think seven generations ahead. Mm -hmm. I know that's not how politics works in our country, but that's what I would like to see. <laughs> So we also got several questions about, uh, uh, about Prop 37, and, and so let me just uh, ask the one that was actually asked uh, relatively frequently, which is, uh, are there any unintended consequences of Prop 37 that people need to be thinking about? This is from, uh, from several people. One person says, I'm in favor of Prop 37. Uh, but I'm concerned about whether or not there are any potential unintended <laughs> adverse consequences. Of, of I think there's seven. always unintended consequences to everything in life, actually. Um, that's part of the way things are. But the, I, uh, there's none that I'm particularly aware of that are adverse. Um, it's true that, for example, 
animal products from animals fed genetically modified, genetically engineered grain and other feeds would not be labeled. So someone wouldn't be able to tell. Um, but if the meat product or dairy product is organic, they would have that assurance that it wasn't genetically engineered. Um, and if the animal itself was genetically engineered, and we may have that with salmon soon, um, uh, frankenfish it's called, um, then that would be genetic, that would be labeled. Um, there are, uh, in the No on 37, there's the critique being made that these exemptions, for example, to the animal products um, from animals fed GMO grain, don't make sense. Actually, the exemptions follow specifically and close to exactly the pattern that's been established in the European Union and in fact in 61 other nations that require some degree of labeling of genetically engineered foods. That's why the exemptions were, were directed in the bill the way they are. It's not actually the, a, 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 a random. It's very specific to follow in the footsteps and create a global um, uh, connect, uh, network. Yeah. Michelle. So I've been doing a lot of writing about Prop 37. If you want to um, go to my blog, appetiteforprofit.com, you'll see um, all of the deconstructed uh, lies that I've been writing about. And um, so just to name uh, sort of the top two, because John's hit on a number of them, but um, the, the two sort of favorite lies of the No campaign are one, that food prices are going to, this is the scaremongering, that food prices are going to go up. Right, and this is you know the typical refrain really with any regulation that the way they scare people with um, with higher prices, and uh, this is simply nonsense. The economic uh, studies um, they were not studies; they were just you know a couple of white papers paid for obviously by the No campaign um, were based on uh, wild assumptions um, that the food manufacturers would actually replace their current ingredients with organic ingredients, and yes, that would be more expensive, but that's not likely to happen. Um, is they'll just have to label their products, and consumers will make decisions that, however they make them. So the scaremongering around higher food prices is, is simply nonsense. The other scare tactic has been um, lawsuits. Oh my God, you know, written by trial lawyers for trial. I mean, all this craziness around, you know, the scary lawyers. And, um, you know, the the measure was specifically written to not incentivize lawyers to be able to sue over this. And with labeling, believe it or not, most food companies do actually follow the law. So it's not like, you know, this measure gets passed and the lawsuits come. It's that companies follow the law. If they don't follow the law, yes, it means that they may be subject to, um, to lawsuits just like they are now for not following the law, for deceptive labeling. There's no different, really, than the types of laws we have in place already. So those are the two scare tactics that um, we should not believe. Okay. So we have two minutes left on the panel, and so what I'd like to do is just give each of you 30 seconds <laughs> to tell the audience the one thing that you want them to remember when they leave this auditorium. So <laughs> I'm actually going to start with you, Michelle. All right. Um, my main thing is uh, to think about these issues as political. Like, that's sort of my mantra. And to not just engage in what I call the happy programs of, you know, more fresh produce and more farmers markets and all those sort of local programs that are important, necessary, but insufficient. Get political, get involved with groups like um, EWG, you know, and a couple other groups I want to give a shout out to. Food Democracy Now! is an incredible grassroots group in Iowa. I work with Center for Food Safety, doing wonderful work on GMOs. Corporate Accountability International, um, Campaign for Commercial for Childhood. Anna Lepe has a great new project out called Food Mythbusters. There are so many ways to get involved. So that is my call, a shout out to you. Find a group that mm. speaks to you, whether it's at the national level, local level, and just get involved. John. I guess my point would be that these programs are critically important to family farmers across the country. And we all probably have a little bit of a different perception of what a family farm looks like. It has changed a lot, certainly from when I was a kid growing up on the farm to what our farm looks like today. But when we talk about reform, and reform certainly needs to take place, uh, I just want you to know that these are programs that I think do help provide the ability of an awful lot of family farms to remain in family control. Uh, in the way of helping manage risk. Uh, they do help provide 
our ability to provide some benefits uh, in a conservation sense uh, that uh, we need to make sure and protect and make sure that that continues to be an important part of the Farm Bill. And as we go about you know, trying to cut to address our nation's uh, fiscal concerns, uh, as we go about trying to reform to find a more appropriate mix or a better policy signal to send to agriculture, uh, let's think very carefully about what the implications are to folks that are relying uh, on their livelihood, providing very valuable services and goods to the country, uh, and what the impact is on them. Okay, thanks. Okay, well, Sorry. okay, more than one thing. I'm going to do a list. <laughs> so, 30 um, seconds, but more than one so, thing. So, right, so, so get political. Michelle's right. We need all of you to be political. That means making calls to your member of Congress regularly about food policy. And today, EWG and uh, many other food leaders announced a new organization called Food Policy Action, and that's going to help you get political. It's, it holds our Congress people accountable by um, putting, publishing a scorecard that lets you know how they voted on food policy issues. So check it out, foodpolicyaction.org. Um, EWG.org you can go to to find out more about our organization. Um, if you care about Yes on 37, please phone bank. Um, they need your help phone banking. Every, it, it'll make a huge difference. Um, and um, and keep, keep, voting with your do keep, shot, keep voting with your dollars. And, and vote um, with your vote. And vote with your vote. <laughs> and don't just vote with your dollars, but talk to every single, like sh all the stores, all the restaurants, institutions, wherever you work. You can change the food system that you're working at, that you, that you operate in. You can change that, and that will help. But, but please do uh, get political. Thanks. And finally, John. Well, I, I love what you said. I, I, I love that the conversation is happening. And, and you need to be part of it. We all need to be part of it. Talk about what matters to you with the people that you care about. And, and talk about it at, a increasingly, at a, an increasingly deep way so that your hearts are involved and not just your heads and so that all of our hearts are touched, and then our lives change. This, the change we need is so profound, and it, it's going to take all of us, and in ways that we haven't yet imagined. So I'm not sure what step, other than stay alive, keep breathing, and keep doing the best that you can, and it will get better. Thank you. So I want to bring Christopher back up here, but I also want to have you join me in thanking what I think was an absolutely fantastic panel and for John again. I don't really have anything to say other than thank you, Buzz, for moderating. That's a tough yeah. job to do, and I think you did a great job. This is the capstone of a fabulous day. Thanks, everybody, for coming out. And go vote, go eat, <laughs> and uh, we'll be back next year with Food Summit 4. Thank you all. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.